message title today. Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? The title of this message comes from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, which in my opinion is the greatest sermon preached anywhere, any place, any time by anyone. I believe it's such a great sermon that if people would simply put into practice that which Jesus taught in this sermon, they would spend a lot less time worrying about things they have little or no control over. Reading Matthew 6, verses 27 through 34, and my scripture readings, they are going to come from the New Living Translation. It's a good translation. You may like, how many remember it was just called the Living Bible? Then it became the Living Translation. I prefer my, my daily Bible. I use a New King James, but I thought I'd get this out of the New Living Translation, Dave. Here we find this part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount speaking about worry. Beginning to read in verse 27 of chapter 6, Jesus says this. Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing. Yet Solomon in all of his glory was not dressed as beautiful as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully about the wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat? Or what will we drink? Or what will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. And He will give you everything you need. Say, everything I need. Verse 34, so don't worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Let's bow our hearts in prayer. Father God, I pray that today's message would speak to people's hearts. And if there's one or more persons here today, Lord, that they seem to worry about everything and anything. I pray your voice, not mine, but your voice would be heard through the power of your words. And they will realize, as the title of the message says, can all your worries add even a single moment to your life? Jesus be Jesus. And we will give you praise. Amen. Again, the message titles on the screen, can all your worries add a single moment your life. I have a question for you. Do you think that maybe, just maybe, Jesus knows everything there is to know about everything, including the negative effects that worry could have on your life? Well, being Jesus as God and being God as omniscient or all-knowing, every one of us should answer that question with a resounding yes. If you believe God knows everything about everything, say Amen. Well, your amen means, and so be it. You agree with that. However, even though we do believe Jesus is God, and even though we do believe that God is omniscient or all-knowing, most of us, myself included, for whatever reason, will attempt to get a second or third or even a thirtieth opinion on every single subject under the sun, especially if it's something that would cause us to worry a little bit. Speaking of which, Dr. John A. Schindler, a world-famous doctor at the Oshner Clinic in New Orleans, Louisiana, shares his opinion concerning a sickness slash disease that has literally reached epidemic proportions here in America. For those of you who are taking notes, you may want to write this down because Dr. Schindler's diagnosis or sickness for this disease that's reached epidemic proportions here in America he uses a simple five-letter diagnosis. Here's how to spell it. W. Everybody say W. Everybody say O. Everybody say R. Everybody say R again. Everybody didn't say Y. What does that spell? There you go. By the way, Dr. Schindler came up with this diagnosis after reviewing the medical charts of five hundred consecutive patients 
who entered and were admitted to the Ochsner Clinic. He took the charts and he separated them into two piles. Different doctors examining these patients, but yet he, a world-famous doctor, looked at all the charts, not to change what the doctors had diagnosed, but looked at it, and he discovered in these two piles, 500 people, consecutive patients. 385 of the 500 patients, or 77% of the patients that were admitted that week into the Ostner Clinic suffered from either, well, they were either worried sick or sick of worrying. Hmm. Worried sick, sick of worrying. Many of us have heard that term before, but few, if any of us, knew that that could actually be a medical diagnosis. And I would suggest if 77% or 385 of 500 in a world-famous clinic hospital, if that was the problem there, how many think that maybe, just maybe, that would be considerable or consistent statistic in hospitals here in America? Anyways, with Dr. Schindler's medical diagnosis in mind, worry. Let me ask you again. Do you think that maybe, just maybe, Jesus knows everything there is to know about everything, including the negative effects worry could have on your life? Obviously, he does. Therefore, I decided to look at both Old Testament and New Testament to see if there was any scripture that would tell me what I could do if I'm afflicted with this condition called worry. Believe me, as a pastor, sometimes you worry about the people like you or they don't like you. The people want you or they want you to leave. Are we going to be able to pay the light bill, the phone bill? Are we gonna, last night or yesterday when Don Williamson informed me, actually informed me Friday evening, as I was sitting at my granddaughter's softball game, and by the way, i got to give a little plug for her. She is a starting third baseman for USF. And Friday night at about 7 o'clock, the game was tied in the 11th inning, and she came to bat with a person on second base, and she went to a three and two count, and there were two outs. And Barbara said, should we pray? I said, prayer doesn't work. Barbara was there going, Jesus, please don't let my granddaughter strike out. Please don't let my granddaughter strike out. She's the same person that prays for Pentecostal parking spaces at the mall when she gets them. On a three and two count, the pitcher from St. Joe's out of Philadelphia threw the ball at 72 mile an hour, which at softball, that's equivalent of 105 mile an hour fastball in baseball. She swung, and next thing we heard was a crack, and I opened my eyes, Barbara opened her eyes because she was praying, and the ball was headed out toward the center fielder. And the center fielder turned around and was running toward the fence. And as she rounded first base, don't know if she'll get to play anymore, Hi, Papa. Hi, Mimi. Two run homers, they beat St. Joe's. And I thought about that. Well, I guess God cares about the negative effects because I know Barbara. If she had struck out, she would go, I hope she gets to play in the next game. I hope she gets this. Those negative effects about worry. I decided that I was going to look into God's Word and see what He has to say about worry. And you've heard me, if you've been here before, you've heard me say you'll never really understand the New Testament till you get a better understanding of the Old. Our Scripture Foundation, greatest sermon preached anywhere, any place, any time, it speaks part of that message about not worrying. Well, here in the Old Testament book of Psalms, we find this divine instruction, Psalms 37, 1 through 7. Don't worry about the wicked or envy those who do wrong. For like grass, they soon fade away. Like flowers, they soon wither. Trust in the Lord and do good. Then you will live safely in the land and prosper. Take delight in the Lord and He will give you your heart's desires. Commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust Him and He will help you. He will make your innocence radiate like the dawn. 
and the justice of your cause will shine like the new day sun. Be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for Him to act. Moving now to the New Testament book of Philippians, we find Paul writing this divine instruction in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Don't worry about what? Wow. Now I'll be the first to admit that those words, don't worry about anything, they are a lot easier said than done. I remember my dad as I was growing up and when I went to ministry, he said, Eddie, you're going to find out that this book is a whole lot easier to read than it is to put the teachings of that book into practice. So I'll admit it. The words about don't worry about anything, they're a lot easier to say or read than they are to do. However, easy or not, when it comes to worry, I believe God's Word would have me share with you that which St. Paul wrote to the church of Philippi. Again, he's the guy that says, don't worry about everything. In chapter 2, leading up to that, he says this, God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases Him. Do you understand what's being said here? Do you understand that God's voice speaking to us through the power of His Word is saying that God is working. He's at work in our everyday life. He's at work giving us the desire and the power to do that which is pleasing Him. Maybe we need to stop and think about that. Whenever we worry, maybe we need to stop and say, God, you said you're already at work in my life. Have you ever seen that little t-shirt that says, God's still working on me? Well, he's working on you. He's giving you, God, give me the desire not to focus on the negative. Give me the desire to focus on the positive because that's going to give me the power to do that which is pleasing in your life. I'll admit it. The board, Al was nice enough not to say this. When we decided to build that building about next door, I was worried. How are we going to pay for that thing with the number of people we have? How are we going to get this thing done? And then, by the way, whenever a contractor tells you that it's going to cost X amount of money to build something, I know from building other buildings through the years as a pastor, add 20% to what they tell you. Well, it took 12 years to do it, not build the building. We had the building built in about seven or eight months. And during that time, did we have some obstacles? Oh, yeah. As soon as the drywall went up, Vandals came in and cut the drywall up, tore it apart. I mean, it was unbelievable. More money spent because it takes just as much money to tear the drywall down and then put it up again. It takes just as much building material to tear those things down and put them back up again. Was I worried? Yeah. But God told me He's working in me. He's working through me. And He has the power. He'll put the power in me to do that which is necessary to please Him. We didn't beg for money. We didn't even have what they call a, uh, a financial campaign to raise the money necessary to do the build. And a year ago, we paid that building off. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. And by the way, the insurance company won't let us insure it for $450,000. Guess how much they say it'll cost to replace that building? $1.3 million to replace that. To God be the glory. He gave the board and He gave you the wisdom to build that building when it would cost less than a half a million dollars to do it. And I'm the guy going, oh God, how are we going to do this? How are we gonna... Because I'll be honest with you, whether you're here or whether you're not, when the mortgage payment comes in, it crosses my desk. When the light bill comes in, it crosses my desk. When the salaries come in, I sign those checks. When things take place, and I'm going, oh God, to God be the glory. Great things He hath done. So loved He the world that He gave it. Anybody ever wondered why I really say Jesus is the pastor of the church? Because I'm tired of people saying, well, you're the guy sitting behind the big desk. He's the guy sitting on the throne. He's the real pastor of the church. You see, God is saying, through His Word, that He will give you the power and the desire to do whatever is necessary that pleases Him. Question. 
Do you believe it pleases God for you to worry about things you have no control over? Again, I would say, no, it doesn't please God, but I have to go to his word to encourage me not to worry about things I have absolutely no call over. And because of that, in my first church, I was a youth pastor. I was an associate pastor. But 29, I became the lead pastor of a church of 13 people. I was 29 years old. They had a mortgage payment of about $1,100 a month. How was 13 people going to pay for that? I was supposed to be paid $250 a week if it came in. And there were several months we debated moving out of the rental house and moving in the Sunday school unit because we weren't sure how we were going to do it. So when I first became a lead pastor, I went to my dad and I said, Dad, how do you deal with this? Because he'd been a pastor since he'd been about 25 years old. I said, how do you deal with this? And he said, I haven't figured that out yet. Maybe you better just ask God. And so I did at the age of 29. I said, God, if you don't help me overcome worry, I won't last. And by the way, this is a statistic, not just in the Assemblies of God, but it's in denominations, independent works across this country. Anyone want to take a guess? If five men or young, women, young men or young women went into the ministry today, how many of them would still be in the ministry five years from now? One. But if they make it through those five years, you can't get them out. Why? Not because they never worry but because they know that God called them, that it wasn't just a job. Anyways, at the age of 29, getting back to the message, I, as a lead pastor for the first time, I said, God, I've got so many worries. And talk about worry. My first Sunday there, my first Sunday there, 13 people. Lady Mrs. Weber, I'll never forget it. You know I've told you I could picture the 200 plus people I've buried here. First Sunday there. Her husband goes out to get the car to pull up to the, and the over, we didn't have like a big building, we had a small building, we had a little hanger overhang like at the office complex there. And he went out to get the car and he says, honey, I'll get the car and I'll bring it up. And she's there, we're talking to her and the entire congregation is able to be in the lobby, of that little lobby. And we're talking and they're telling me what a good sermon it was. I didn't know that Christian people lied, but it was my first past lead pastor sermon. <laughs> And they were telling me how wonderful it was and they were going to continue to come to church. And all of a sudden we hear, honk, honk, honk. And I said, Mrs. Weber, I think your husband's waiting on you. Better go out. She said, no, he's going to pull up. Honk, honk, honk. I said, well, I better go see if something's wrong. Walked out to his car, opened his door, and he fell out cold, stole dead on the ground. I had never preached a funeral before that. Had one three days later. Guess what I did? took his Bible and said, this is the gospel according to. <laughs> Been doing it ever since. I had asked the Lord, how do I overcome worry? And I believe God heard and answered my prayer. And he's given me pretty much a three-step plan to overcome worry. And I thought if you're taking notes, you might like to write this down. Maybe he'll give you a different plan, but this is what he gave me. Like, I'm not going to say Ed Hartman, but that's what he was saying to me. Ed Hartman, invest your time in work instead of in worry. Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, penned these words in Proverbs chapter 6. Take a lesson from the ants, you lazy bones. Learn from their ways and become wise. Now, as a new pastor in a church of 13 people, I went to the office every day and I sat there. I said, okay, now what? I mean, there was nobody to follow me around. There were no cell phones. There were no fax machines. At least we didn't have one. So nobody could have bothered me all day long. I could have just sat there all day long. And God, I said, well, I'll read the Bible if nothing else. Take a lesson from the ant, Ed Hartman, you lazy person. Because I was just sitting there for about a week doing nothing. Learn from their ways and become wise. Why would Solomon compare a wise individual to an ant? I thought about that. And I came to the conclusion, in fact, outside of our church there in Jupiter, Florida, we had these palmetto bushes, and right underneath them there'd be these ant hills. So I walked out there after reading that verse, I said, okay, God, compare to an ant. 
I want to be wise because Solomon asked you for wisdom. I want to be wise. When you have 13 and you're down to 12 the first week, it's probably you need to get some wisdom here. I noticed something by observing the ant, and I assume that Solomon observes the same thing. I noticed that the ants never waste their time worrying over things they couldn't control, like a 29-year-old preacher kicking the anthill. Spraying rout out on the rant hill. Dumping bleach on the land hill. One of the reasons I think God wants us to compare ourselves to the end if we want to be wise is they never waste their time worrying over things that they cannot control. For example, I doubt if any ant ever stopped working because some clod like me kicked over their anthill or poured poison on their anthill or tried to wipe out their anthill. Instead of worrying about something they couldn't control, ants will simply continue to work. They'll put one foot in front of their other, accomplishing what they can, and never worrying about things that are beyond their control. And I believe God spoke to my heart in 1979 saying, be like an ant. Work to the best of your ability. You don't have to worry about somebody else's ability. Work to the best of your ability. And stop worrying about things you have no control over. And to be honest with you, in all my years in the ministry, I've never worried about finances one time. I've never took a special offering per se as far as we've got to have money for this, we've got to have money for that. I might mention these things, but never take it. And God has graced me, blessed me with people in every church who pay their tithe, who do what they're supposed to do. I talked to a pastor this week on the phone. He said, Ed, please pray for me. I said, why? He said, if we don't have $2,000 by Monday morning, our lights are going to be turned off in our church. And I said to him, I said, have you told the people? He said, yeah, I tell them every week. I, tell them. I said, stop telling them and start telling God. How many of you that's a good idea? I can't wait to hear from them tomorrow telling me we had the money come in to pay the light bill. I believe that's going to take place. We need to stop worrying about things we have no control over, work to the best of our ability, and leave the rest to God. Here's step number two in my three-step plan. Seek fulfillment of your needs, not your wants. I love to read. My wife says, if, I, if you look at my office, you'll see hundreds and hundreds of books. If you come to my house, you'll find hundreds and hundreds and more hundreds of books in my garage now because our house is all that water damage. In the year 1901, sociologists reported that the average American wanted 72 things. 1901, the average American needed, wanted 72 things. Anyone guess how many things they actually needed? How many believe it'd be 50? 72 things is what they wanted. They only needed 18 things of those things they wanted. Anyone guess? How many things the average American wanted in the year 2001? How many believe it was 172 things? How many believe it was 272 things? How many want to believe it was 372 things or even 472 things? If you picked any of those numbers, you'd be wrong. In the year 2001, the average American wanted 496 things. Wow. Wow. Now guess how many things they needed in the year 2001? 18. <laughs> how about today? I'm not even getting, I, I don't know the answer to this one, how many things the average American wants, but it's probably more than 496 because 16 years have gone by. They wanted. And you want to guess how many things they need in the year 2017? 18. If you look at God's Word, you'll notice that God seems more interested in what we have need of than what we want. St. Paul, right under divine inspiration, again says this in Philippians 4.19. You probably could quote, quote it. In fact, I'm going to use the, uh, I think I put up there uh, New King James, but it's not. It's supposed to be the New Living Translation again. It says this. Oh, you put it up in the King James he puts it up there. I'm going to read it this way then. And this same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. King James and my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. 
Hmm. Needs versus wants. Everybody say that with me. Needs versus wants. To refresh your memory, in the year 1901, the average American wanted 172 things and only needed 18 of them. In the year 2001, the average American wanted 496 things and needed 18 things of them. I would suggest that in the year 2017, I don't know how many they want, but the average American probably still only needs 18. All of that to say this, I believe one of the biggest problems we Christians face, because the Bible talks about non-believers wanting things, but I believe one of the biggest problems we Christians face is discerning the difference between needs and wants. Speaking of which, in Paul's letter to a young preacher named Timothy, Paul narrowed the need list down to two things. Anybody know what those two things are? Food and clothing. I think that's a good idea. Food, you got to have that. And believe me, I've been to the beach. I don't go much anymore, but some people need to get some clothing. That's all I'm trying to say. Here are Paul's words to a young preacher named Timothy. So if we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. Not yet, little darling. Now this is for our visitor. If I say in closing, it means nothing. But if you see Barbara go to the piano, it means everything. We're almost there, so I need to wait about two more minutes. Time for review. Step one and step two in this three-step plan I believe the Holy Spirit gave me as a 29-year-old lead pastor. This three-step plan to overcome worry are as follows. Number one, invest your time in work instead of worry. Number two, seek fulfillment of your needs, not your wants. Believe me, even at 29 years old, I wanted a lot of things. And I'd get frustrated when they didn't come. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. All these other things will be added unto you. Wow. Now let's look at step three. Concentrate on today, not yesterday or tomorrow. Concentrate on today. As a reader, I've read that ocean liners are built in such a way that by pressing a certain button, the captain of the ship can actually lower a series of steel doors which will totally seal off one part of the ship from another. Anybody want to know why he needs the ability to do that? In case the ship hits an iceberg or it crashes into another ship, or in wartime, a missile or something knocks out part of the ship. If part of the ship hull has been ruptured, the ship will be able to remain afloat if the captain has the ability to carbentalize or seal off the rest of the ship. Now, I'm not sure if this makes a lot of sense to everybody, but if there's someone here today, and maybe you're worried about your finances or you're worried about your health, or you're worried about your marriage, or you're worried about some other area of your life. I believe that we must learn to shut the doors on yesterday's failures and tomorrow's unknowns. And thinking about how a person could do that, I was reminded of the story of a young boy. Maybe you've heard it before. I think I've told it here at least once in 20 years. Of a young boy who went to his father and said, Dad, I'm a Christian, I'm a new Christian, and I'm still struggling with was sin. You think it's possible for me to live my entire life? He was about 15 years old. He said, you think it's possible for me to live my entire life without ever sinning again in word, thought, or deed? And the father looked at him, put his arm around him, smiled and said, son, I, I'm a lot older than you and I, I prayed that God would help me not sin in word, thought, or deed, but I do on occasion sin in word, thought, or deed. And I don't think anybody could live their entire life without sinning in word, thought, or deed. And so the boy said, well, Dad, you, you think it's possible? I'm 15. You think I could make it to my 16th birthday? Just one year. I've only been a Christian for a few days. You think I could live one whole year without sinning in word, thought, or deed? His dad said, maybe if you'd lock yourself in a room and never leave and have a Bible that would read 
you may be able to pull that off, but I, I don't think you're going to be able to do that, son. You're in society. You're part of the world system, even though you live for God. I don't think it's possible for you or anyone else to leave even a year without sinning in word, thought, or deed one time. So the boy tears at his eyes. He said, well, Dad, what about a month or a week? Do you think anybody could live a month? I could live a month or a week. And his dad shook his head and said, Son, I'm sorry. I'm not sure anybody could live a whole month or even a whole week without sinning one time in word, thought, or deed. And finally, the boy looked up at his dad and says, Dad, if I could live just one day, he says, every night I go to bed, I feel like I'm getting re-saved. I know I'm not. I know I'm saved. But every night I feel like I messed up again sometime during the day. And I say, Lord, would you please forgive me for what I did today? Help me not sin in word, thought, or deed. And then the next day I find myself doing something or saying something I shouldn't do or say. Dad, do you think I could just get to the point where I could live one day, one day, without sinning in word, thought, or deed? And his dad says, well, you know what? I'll join you in that. Let's pray right now. Let's ask God to help both of us live one day, just one day, without sinning, without gossiping, without doing wrong. Help me to lift people up instead of tear people down. Help me do what's right. Help us live one day without sinning in word, thought, or deed. And they prayed, and the boy looked at his dad, 15 years old, and said, Daddy, I believe that's how I'm going to live my life. One day at a time. Well, darling, it's time. For our visitor of visitors, when little darling, my wife, goes to the piano, and by the way, she ended up having knee surgery because she was worried about me for two, year, two back surgeries for a year, Lifting me out of bed, the doctor finally told she messed up the meniscus trying to get me up, so she's not allowed to do that anymore. But as Barbara comes to the piano and Jonathan prepares to come and lead us in a closing song, I want to remind you of Dr. John Schindler's diagnosis of a sickness or a disease that has reached epidemic proportions here in America. And I remember what his diagnosis was. What was it? worry. So I have a question for you in closing. What worries you the most? Do your finances worry you the most or should I say your lack of finances worry you? What about your health? What about discord in your family or even in your church family? What about something else, anything else? Friends, I believe if you'll keep your mind focused on Jesus and what He said in the Sermon on the Mount about worry, not to do it, I believe instead of worrying, you'll soon find peace, peace, a peace that passes all human understanding coming down from the Father above. The prophet Isaiah penned these words in the 26th chapter in the third verse of his Old Testament book. You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you. All whose thoughts are fixed on you. Would you bow your heart with me in prayer? Father God, I don't know who here today is worried about certain situations. I confess, Lord, that... Uh, as a 29-year-old pastor, I find myself worrying about things I had no control over. And you spoke to my heart as a young minister telling me what to do. And I found when I follow your instructions in that area, I have good and success. And when I don't, well, I suffer varying degrees of failure. Help us take what we learned today. Help it apply to our life. Help us to focus on you. And as we do that, Lord, I believe that we'll have peace instead of worry. We'll have joy instead of worry. We'll have all, everything we need instead of worrying about things we don't have. Jesus be Jesus in all your beauty, all your splendor, all your